Today is February 22nd, 2007. We're doing an oral history interview for the archives at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. I'm Charles Lundquist. Our guest today is Dr. Russell Shelton. Russell, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Uh, can you start out by telling us a little bit about your youth, where you spent your youth, where you were educated, and how you ended up in the space program? Thank you. I'd be glad to. The uh, first thing I want to say is that I want to express my appreciation to Dr. Lundquist. He was my first supervisor when I arrived on the scene. And I might say he was a very good one. He quickly got me promoted so I would be out of his way. <laughs> and I certainly enjoyed my association with him over the years. Well, those are kind words, Russ. Thank you. But let's get back to your youth. <laughs> well, I was born in Kentucky on a small farm which raised tobacco, the evil weed, peaches, raspberries, and all sorts of Kentucky Wonder beans to sell to the local grocery stores. I arrived weighing two pounds and felt that getting a late start or a small start, I had to do a lot of eating and but you caught get over up. that. I got over You it. caught up. Uh, caught up very well. I went to Junction City High School in Kentucky, was the valedictorian. After graduating from high school, I joined the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a sort of a, where I was, was a, a literacy school. It was teaching people to read and write, mostly from eastern Kentucky and western Virginia. And it had a radio school there. Right after that, I went to Berea College for a year, and then to the U.S. Army Air Corps. What year was that then? 1946. I'm sorry, 1942. 42, right. And then in the Army, they sent me to engineering school in a program that was called the Army Specialized Training Program, and then to radio school, where I was a, later a radio instructor, to an electronic school at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and to a radar school in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. And from there to a high-altitude bomb squadron, which was slated to go overseas. Fortunately, the war was over before I could get on the first plane to get across on the other side. After the war, I went to Center College for a short period and then to Eastern Kentucky University where I t took a degree in mathematics and physics. I had to take a degree in mathematics because the physics people were loaded up with biology and chemistry, which I tried to avoid at that time. Appreciate it a little more later. <laughs> and the <clears throat> um, mathematics people could take anything they wanted to as an elective, whereas the physics people were loaded up with the junk I mentioned. Not junk, perhaps, but uh, things that weren't physics. Well, it was the, the topic you mentioned. Yeah. Yes. So, majored in math, got a teaching certificate at and started teaching school in eastern Kentucky in the coal camp of McRoberts, Kentucky. While I was there, I saw on the bulletin board that they were offering scholarships at the University of Tennessee, which paid more than I was making teaching school in eastern Kentucky. So I decided that was a good deal and went to graduate school to the University of Tennessee. While I was there, I had a teaching assistantship with the University and taught physics at a sophomore level while I took graduate courses there. Graduated in 1953, went to the my first job at General Dynamics Fort Worth, where everybody was working on the nuclear-powered airplane, which was a very interesting program. The 
bad thing about it was that it was harder to build airplanes than it was to build submarines. So the Navy built their submarines very successfully, and the nuclear-powered aircraft sort of went by the wayside because it just wasn't practical to do it. There were too many shielding problems. The submarines had huge amounts of water to separate the troops from the radiation of the reactor, but the aircraft was sort of supposed to be light and therefore couldn't carry much shielding and it just couldn't work out. And it never was, has. Never has. And the, uh, then I went to Admiral Corporation uh, to head up a nuclear engineering department, physics, and uh, we built a 20,000 Curie Cobalt 60 source Oof. in the middle of Chicago. <laughs> Today we'd never be able to get away with that, but it's run successfully all these years and it's been uh, never had a problem. What, what was the use? Medical or? Well, it was used to study the uh, radiation effects of gamma and neutron radiation on a, a equipment, military equipment that was supposed to survive in case of a nuclear okay. attack. So it, was a, it was a research tool then? Yeah, it was a research tool. And it was a very interesting thing at Admiral. They had, were just learning that the Japanese were making very good equipment. And I was called in one day, and the chief engineer showed me this wonderful Japanese stereo equipment, which was rather small, whereas the stuff we made was rather large. And we operate under the philosophy that people would want more for the money and they wouldn't pay a lot of money for something that big. Of course, that time has changed. Then, uh, with Admiral looking like it was going to fail in the TV and radio business because of the uh, Japanese competition, I looked around for a job and found one in Huntsville, Alabama, working for the Army Ballistic Mil Missile Agency. And my first supervisor there was Dr. Lundquist. And that was what year? 1958. 1958. Yes. Uh, after the first satellite then? Or just yeah, well, or about the time uh, that that happened? Actually, uh, my first job there was to look at the returns from the first satellite measuring the radiation belt around Van Allen had a Geiger counter and Geiger other counter and other counters. I guess I don't know about what he had. Yeah. And the uh, I rolled all that data out that came back from the uh, tele telemetry system and looked for places where the radiation was being encountered. Then I stripped that out and sent it to Van Allen, and that was the uh, beginnings of the Van Allen's fame for discovering the radiation belt around the Earth. So that you, you got in on the the very beginning of a very exciting field. Then yes, it was it was very exciting. I really enjoyed it. And then later on, we looking at the things that. I did while I was at Marshall Space Flight Center, which it later became as first Army Ballistic Missile Agency, it became the Marshall Space Flight Center. In July 1960. NASA. Yeah. The transition was July 1st, 1960. Yeah. So, um, let's see. Uh, uh, you were with the Army a couple of years and then. Yeah. Yeah. And then the. Uh, I mentioned a few things that I really enjoyed doing in my career. After NASA, I went to be the... Well, what, what more did you do at NASA? Let's not leave okay. NASA quite so soon. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, the, the most important thing I did was the act as the... Uh, 
university liaison officer for the Marshall Space Flight Center under from Brown. And the idea was that we had one of the largest technical populations in the country here with no real university opportunities for them to do graduate work or even to get their initial degrees. And the University of Alabama was operating a fairly large university, if you count the number of people, for courses here at Redstone Arsenal. And so they were teaching courses all over Redstone Arsenal in the local high schools. And we thought that we needed a university here and we had as good a justification for it as anybody else in Alabama. And the beginning of that was when Dr. from Brown went to the university or went to the Alabama legislature and sold them the idea of the research center, the University of Alabama Research Institute. It was brought in it was started, I guess, by an initial grant, and uh, Dr. Rudolph Herman was brought in to head it up. The idea that we tried to carry out was that we would hire people who would, I say we, I work with them in the hiring of people who would uh, be good graduate instructors later on. So we started acquiring a physics staff which taught courses still at the arsenal in the room that was provided while the research institute was being built. The, the mechanism, I guess, was the uh, Graduate Studies Steering Committee, which was the Joint mm -hmm. Army mm -hmm. NASA committee that was promoting these activities you mentioned. Yeah, I didn't have a lot of interface with the steering committee. Um, there were people like Milton Cummings, who was the uh, president of Brown Engineering, who would entertain all of the people that we, we were trying to hire. They, he invited the three hires over to his house, and they had dinner, and we talked about what a great place Huntsville was, and of course I believed it. And. Uh, it was quite a, an interesting time just collecting people to run the university. Another thing that happened which was quite important, I thought, was that the National Academy of Sciences and the Marshall Space Flight Center, NASA, came to an agreement that we would bring in scientists from all over the world, the best scientists we could find from France, England. We didn't bring in any Russian, but we brought in Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese, Thai lines, um, people from all over the world. We brought them in, put them physically at the Marshall Space Flight Center. And, and you were the Marshall interface for doing that, is that yes. right? Right. Dr. Lapp of the uh, National Science Foundation and I chose the people that would be sent here to do the work at the Marshall Space Flight Center. We did very well by having a very good computer capabilities and a lot of people arrived just dying to get on a good computer because we had one of the few good computers in the world at that time. And uh, people came and especially theoretical physicists had a great time solving problems that they couldn't get around to in their own country because they didn't have the computer capabilities. And one guy came in and he said, well, with your computer, I can, write, I can write about 35 papers this year. <laughs> so he had a good publishing time with all the problems he'd saved up but didn't have the computer capabilities to do. Who were some of the outstanding people that were brought in? Do you remember any of them? Well, I remember all of them, but I may have trouble calling names. But all right. I, let's see if I can recall a few. Uh, Upendra Roy from India. Uh, uh, one guy I remember especially well was John Paul Gregory because he had the same name as the 
first preacher at the First Methodist Church. Oh, I see. Exactly the same name. So he came in from England, and he, uh, I guess he's still on the Alabama staff. Uh, uh, John Gregory has made a career in here in Huntsville first, mm -hmm. working a good deal with NASA, and then became a professor at at UH and I believe has retired now. Mm -hmm. But he's still around. Yeah, well, I remember him especially. And uh, I remember one time where we had the, I've forgotten the name of the man from Jap Japan. And you'll forgive me for forgetting a few things over 50 years. Oh, yeah, ago. yeah. Uh, he was uh, a very outstanding man and he liked to visit the countryside and I worried about him a little going out in the countryside here in Alabama but he said he was treated well everywhere he went and uh, he was visited while he was with us by the Japanese ambassador and people the protocol people were upset that we had him stationed in a bullpen over in structural mechanics structure and mechanics and they didn't want the ambassador to see that we hadn't treated him as well as we ought to. I used that as a wedge to get all the people treated a little better. Very good. But the problem, of course, was that we had a lot of people. People were crowded, and it was very hard for anybody to find a luxurious quarters. There just wasn't that much space around. Was but, Hannes Walters one of the... Who? Is Hannes Walter from Germany... Did he come in during your no, time? or No, he didn't. It was probably later. I think George Booker picked up the, yeah, the you... program later and brought in several people. Uh, the I don't recall. Something, well, let's see. We had one gentleman who came from India who was reputed, good morning, reputed to be the greatest scholar in India. Yeah, well, <laughs> he, he didn't fit in very well in the countryside. Uh, he had trouble getting his clothes washed and yeah. getting his food prepared and stuff like that and wasn't very happy because he expected all of that to be taken now, not, care of. Not every visitor can, can, can work out. So they, I think that's the only one that didn't. Okay. Well, you interacted a lot during your career with some of the... Von Braun team that came from Germany. Do you have any uh, recollections and thoughts you'd like to share with us this morning? Well, uh, I can say without any reservations that I enjoyed my visit working, I should say my tenure, working with the German team. And I thought of the world as being two types of people back then. They were, there was a German team at the top lab directors and then there were the, I call them southern boys <laughs> of course you're not one of those southern well, boys south but Dakota, south you've Dakota. developed an accent since you've been here well south Dakota <laughs> that's south <laughs> <laughs> anyway the, those were the two branch kinds of people and as far as I'm concerned everybody was great the upper management was great they were very genteel in their manners and their approaches I never heard anybody speak a hard word to anybody during my whole tenure. Now, I've heard a few arguments, but they were all polite, and I thought it was a great place to work, and I really enjoyed it, starting with Dr. Lundquist here, Dr. Stuhlinger, who was a great boss, uh, then, uh, of course, the doctor from Brown, who I claim was the best manager of a research and development empire that I've ever seen. He beat all of our people a great deal when it came to managing a large empire and having everybody work and be happy about it. And he didn't give direct orders. He just talked about it until you volunteered to do what he was trying to get done. And it was a volunteer organization, really, which is sort of and the antithesis to the idea that you've got to have a rough, tough, mean SOB at the top pushing people around and maybe mistreating one here and there to show how tough he is. 
I never saw any of that. The management was strictly, I have this problem, will you help me? And you always volunteered to help. Except for one time that I remember he wanted me to work with some people at NASA headquarters. And I turned him down and worried a lot about turning him down, but uh, I didn't want to go to Washington. I later went to Washington after I left Marshall, and I learned that I had the right opinion to start with. <laughs> but I really didn't want to go to Washington. But well, you were ahead. involved in the Pegasus program, too, if I remember yes, correctly. Yes, uh, that was an interesting program. Uh, it was some of my best work, I guess, follows at Marshall. The in the first place, we worried about uh, meteoroids in space because they presented a hazard to space travel and the people going to the moon had to worry about several things. One was that they might, the spacecraft might be impacted by small rocks or pieces of debris or whatnot out in space. And we needed to find out what was out there and we did a, a little theoretical physics to show that if you stayed in low Earth orbit, you would be more exposed to radiation in the radiation belts, Van Allen belts, and you would also be more exposed to the uh, micrometeoroids because the Earth concentrates the flying stuff that goes around it or by it. And so you the gravitational field of the Earth is right. Yes. And so you worry about low Earth orbits from micrometeoroids and uh, radiation belts. The high distant Earth orbits, like say on the moon, you worry about uh, radiation from the sun. The sun kicks out a lot of high energy proton radiation and you would get wiped out rather quickly if you were out there on the moon when the sun decided to misbehave, have sunspots and stuff like that. So it was an interesting thing to just uh, try to find out what we could about the environment that the people would be in on the way to the moon. By, by that time you were the chief of a uh, unit, I've forgotten the name yeah. of it, that well, was responsible first, for such things. First it was Nuclear and Ion Physics Branch, and then it was the Nuclear and Plasma Physics Division. And as a division chief, I was responsible for the radiation meteoroid environment and was on the Pegasus committee to see that, I guess, we measured what we wanted to measure, namely how many rocks are flying around out there in space. And we launched, I say we, the ground team launched, uh, I think three of those Pegasus satellites, and they measured what was out there. And we, we then had developed the mathematics to extrapolate what we measured near Earth to what it would be farther out. And that worked out beautifully. All of those experiments worked. They flew. There were no problems. Well, there was a little problem in that there are a lot of electrons out there and they have a habit of sticking to whatever you're working with. And if they stack up enough on an insulator, you have little lightning flashes or breaks, breakdowns, which ruin the electronic equipment. So that was a problem, but it was solved by letting the satellites run hot so that the charge would leak off rather than build up on the equipment, mm -hmm. the solar cells and the... Ingenious solution. Yeah, it was. Uh, Gerhard Heller did most of the footwork on that. Mm -hmm. He was a deputy lab chief at uh, the Stuhlinger's uh, Space Sciences Lab, of which he later headed. Uh, so, uh, what came along, or what did you do next? Well, the the American Physical Society uh, asked me to be a visiting lecturer to go to all the colleges around the southeast and talk about space and especially uh, special and general relativity because my division had the uh, 
responsibility at that time for the uh, gravity probe. Well, at first it was the relativistic gyro experiment to test uh, the be uh, the last real test of Einstein's special and general relativity, the only one we could think of at the time after the Rebka pound experiment. And uh, it was interesting to go around and talk about space with the various universities. We especially visited black schools in the South, like Southern University or Miles University in Birmingham and Tulla, let's see, where um, Tuskegee? Tuskegee and uh, several other of the black schools around the country. And the, I guess the most exciting thing was I was called one day by a very active local politicians and he says you need to hire more hire more black people in the Marshall Space Flight Center so I immediately sat around seeing if I could find some black physicists in the country and I finally found one who had graduated from A&M and started working for the Navy in Washington and who wanted to get back to Alabama so I hired Dave McLathery and he immediately became the focus of a lot of attention from the press and the media moving into this part of the country. The general idea was that uh, they were going to integrate the University of Alabama and Tuscaloosa, and they were going to integrate the University of Alabama arm in Huntsville. And a lot of us worried about the fact that if we had a lot of disturbance, it would detract from what our job was. And we wanted to be sure that if somebody stood in the schoolhouse door, it wasn't in Huntsville. Because Huntsville, well, I'll just speak plainly, uh, had a problem in that we had a very large uh, uh, foreign and Yankee contingent and we didn't want to bear the burden of people fighting out the integration issues here in Huntsville and Tuscaloosa. So I talked with uh, Dr. Alex Powell and Dr. Frank Rose about how we would handle this and I talked with Dave McLathery and Dave McLathery was a total gentleman and a scholar in all of this manipulation. And he got his own lawyer. He didn't get the lawyer provided by the activists. He did his own negotiations. Dr. Powell and Dr. Rose and I and Ernst Stuhlinger all agreed that if he wanted to go to the University of Alabama in Huntsville, he could. And he really needed to go to the university to do graduate work because he needed to know more in order to do the kind of job that he needed to be doing. So he signed up to go, went to the University of Alabama in Huntsville, peaceful, except for the uh, journalists and commentators like the Westbrook, the Westbrook Pegler coming by and assuming that we were all bigots and we're all trying to deny somebody their rights and all that sort of stuff that mud that sticks with a lot of people that we didn't want to have anything to do with we were scientists and we wanted to see that science got done and we to be frank with with you we didn't care who did it as long as they were friendly and that's so the integration that. here at UH got or at that time arm of the University of Alabama got done very peacefully. It's very peacefully, very well, friendly. And pre I, appreciate your role in getting that done, Russ. That was a, well, a was major hazardous. accomplishment. It may still be hazardous, but uh, <laughs> well, that it's was, done. That was a good piece of work. Well, you eventually left Marshall. Can you tell us about that? 
Well, I came, uh, I left uh, Huntsville to become the director of the Land Warfare Laboratory of the U.S. Army. And our particular job was to develop small portable equipment for the ground troops. What year was Vietnam. that? That was uh, 1968, onward until the Vietnam War was over, mm -hmm. which was about 19 and. Uh, 78, I guess. Where was that laboratory? That was at Aberdeen Proving Ground in uh, Maryland, just off the East Coast. And uh, after that, I went to the Ballistics Research Laboratory with a demotion because they dissolved that laboratory out from under me when the Vietnam War was over and everybody wanted to get rid of anything that smacked of Vietnam. So my laboratory was the first to go. And uh, I was transferred to the Ballistics Research Laboratory under Dr. Eichelberger. And I did long range planning for one year. That's a very difficult job, by the way, looking into the future and trying to figure out what will happen next or what we should be doing You need doing a good next. crystal ball to do that. Yeah, you do. And uh, I didn't have a crystal ball, but uh, had a lot of ideas about what it would be. And I go back today and read what I predicted would happen and what happened. And I'm not ashamed of the approach I took. The first thing is you can never figure out what will happen next. Like this interview today, I didn't know about this until very suddenly. But anyway, uh, the, uh, they had a bunch of top secret jobs that they were working on and I ended up being the director of a uh, strange program for which I got the Army R&D Award for 1979, 1979 I guess. They, they sent it to me after I had retired and moved to Lawrence County. They sent a delegation down and gave me the Army R&D Award. Well, that was very nice of them. Well, I enjoyed that work too. And then I took a job at Monsanto as an applied mathematician and worked on dye problems where you're, where you're trying to put dye into synthetic fibers and to control the operation so that you get the right color match and that the color remains constant throughout the production so that, process. So that, that work was in Decatur and you were living in near Moulton? Yeah. And then I started work as a, uh, an instructor at Calhoun University in physics and mathematics and electronics and computer science. Uh, instructed all of those at Calhoun and uh, wrote some of the programs for scheduling uh, rooms and professors and courses so that we didn't have conflicts when we all moved into our places for this quarter. So you again. sort of slid into retirement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, and then I worked on a, a computerized uh, lab experiments. Uh, we thought we'd uh, acquaint the students with computer technology attached to uh, Mother Nature, let's say. And one, one of those experiments is you drop a, a piece of metal and watch it fall. Well, everybody knows about falling rocks. And we attach a string to the weight as it falls. It unwinds a potentiometer, which changes the voltage on a analog, analog to digital converter so that you know where the object is all the time. And from that, why well, you can show Newton's second law and Newton's law of gravitation, all printed out on the computer. And then you do a curve fit on the computer to derived the law. So that was also, I think, interesting kind of work. That would be a interesting experiment for PsyQuest. We had an interview with the director of PsyQuest a few days ago. Who's that, if I may ask? Uh, P.D. Horn, or J.D. Horn. Hmm. Well, do you have any final bits of advice for new folks coming into the space program, coming to the Marshall Center. Well, I'll, I can give the same advice that I gave to my grandchildren when they started college. 
good enough. Do something useful. Do something sellable. And physics is a great thing to be in. I've enjoyed it all my life. It's, I've enjoyed what I did. I've enjoyed the people I work with. And I've had a great time. And I think uh, the sciences, I think electronics is exciting. I th think physics is exciting. And uh, engineering is exciting. And by the way, two of my nephews have graduated from the University of Alabama in Huntsville as engineers, one mechanical and one electric. Very good. Well, that's a, a very nice way to end the interview, Russ. We appreciate your coming today and sharing with us your experiences and thoughts. And thank you very much. Well, I've enjoyed working with you since 1958. <laughs> and I it's been fun. look forward to some more. <laughs>